Hey guys, I hope you're all doing well. We're going to talk a little bit about infection control. Um, I know that you guys at the beginning of the school year went over um, how to use PPE and uh, did bloodborne pathogens and HIV training and whatnot, but uh, this is always a good subject to touch on um, and it helps you. It's a little bit more in depth than the um, bloodborne pathogens courses. So um, I just want to go over it with you guys um, and hopefully this will help you with your terms that I assigned um, that will be due on May 29th. So hopefully you're able to get those done. Um, so by the end of this um, lesson students should be able to define and spell the terms to learn for this chapter. Describe two types of multi drug resistant organisms. Uh, describe the chain of infection. This is really important in the medical field. And then identify and describe various types of infections. So, critical thinking question Why is an aseptic environment important? So, aseptic meaning free of um, microorganisms or clean, um, and this is to help prevent infections. We don't want to um, give the patient um, bacteria from our own bodies into a, a wound or a surgical site that they have had, um, and that creates its own bacterial environment. Now, back in the Civil War era, they didn't know that um, washing their hands was an important thing. So they would go from one patient to the next patient to the next patient to the next patient's uh, doing, um, let's say, above the knee amputations and that type of thing. And they didn't wash their hands in between people. And so they didn't realize that hand hygiene was the reason that many of these soldiers died post battle because of their infections that they got during their surgeries um, to help them survive. So that being said, we know that washing our hands is a very critical thing these days. So we wanna make sure that we prevent the spread of infection by using an aseptic technique. So infection control is the process of reducing exposure to pathogens to prevent the spread of disease. Um, so pathogens are disease producing organisms. This could be bacteria, viruses, parasites, um, all sorts of different things. Okay, so um, in healthy individuals, our immune system provides some measure of resistance against pathogens. So for instance, let's say you have had exposure to the chicken pox. You are not likely to get the chicken pox a second time because your body recognizes that you've already had this, this is a bad pathogen, we're gonna block it, okay? So that being said, not all of these um, pathogens will you've had exposure to, for instance, COVID-19, you might not have had exposure to that previously and therefore you have a bigger um, reaction to getting this, to getting sick because of it versus if you've already been exposed. So people suffering from a disease are likely to have um, an, a, compromised, a compromised immune system, making them more susceptible to new infections. So these would be your people with like history of emphysema, COPD, heart disease, diabetes, those type of things, okay? Um, so controlling pathogens is especially important in a medical office. We don't want to um, compromise them anymore by passing on something along that we may have to them. So, um, so asepsis is a state of being free from germs or infection um, and any form of microorganisms. So uh, organisms, these are a systems made up of group of living cells, okay? So that could be yourself, your dog, your cat, those are considered organisms. Microorganisms are organisms that are so small that they cannot be seen except for with a microscope, okay? Sizes of microorganisms, also called microbes, also um, expressed in microbiomes. So not all microorganisms cause disease. So we do have good bacteria and bad bacteria, okay? Not all pathogens cause disease, okay? But types of pathogens can include bacteria, fungi, protozoa, viruses, rickettsia, 
and parasitic worms. So here's some lovely photos of those things that we just talked about. So bacteriology is the study of bacteria, okay? Mycology is the study of fungi, okay? Um, protozoology is the study of protozoa, and virology, viro, virology is the study of viruses. So many microorganisms are not harmful and grow and thrive in our human body. They have helpful functions within the body. So these are also considered normal flora. So microorganisms normally found on the skin and in the urinary and gastrointestinal and respiratory tracts, these are all normal, okay? It's when something comes in or we take an antibiotic that this flora gets out of whack and causes um, uh, opportunistic bacteria or virus or anything like that to come in and take over the system. So what is the ideal temperature for disease? producing pathogens? The answer, your body temperature. So we want to make sure that these guys don't get in our body to begin with to help prevent infection. So how micro microorganisms grow. So microorganisms exist everywhere in nature. They're everywhere. To grow, they require food, moisture, darkness, suitable temperature. There are couple of different types of microorganisms. So we have aerobic, which require oxygen to live, and then we have anaerobic. So these do not require oxygen to live at all. So microorganisms capable of producing disease grow best at body temperature, okay? They destroy and use human tissues as food. We don't want them to do that. We like our bodies. We want them to stay healthy, okay? And then they also excrete uh, waste toxins that are absorbed by and may poison the body. So if you um, are in sepsis or septic shock, it's because you have a bacterial that has gone crazy in your bloodstream and is causing a system-wide infection and is producing toxins that are affecting your whole body. So we don't want them to do that. So what do we do to fix that? Well, we use drugs to fix that. So we have um, lots of different uh, antibiotics that work really well. Um, however, some of these have become overused. So these little bacterial bugs have gotten resistant to them. So this is a growing concern. So these are called multi-drug resistant microorganisms. They are a growing concern in healthcare. They are referred to as superbugs, and they do not respond to tr traditional medications and or treatments. These develop um, resistance to antimicrobial drugs, okay? This also increases the length of hospital stays, increased cost of treatments, and death associated with these organisms. So as a healthcare provider, you want to really look to understand that all of these um, bugs create increased cost in our healthcare system. So we want to reduce costs as a healthcare provider and try not to have doctors prescribe too many um, antibiotics in this day and age now that we know. Um, so people's bodies don't become used to it and those microorganisms that live already in our body um, can't become resistant to it. So, um, you might have a physician that you go in and let's say you have a sinus infection and it's killing you, uh, but you've only had it for three or four days. You've had a headache super, super bad and you're begging him for antibiotics. They will not likely give you antibiotics until you have had 10 days of this sinus infection along with a um, CT scan to make sure that yes, you do have a sinus infection in there and then they'll prescribe you the antibiotics. So I used to be able to go into my doctor and every time I had a sinus infection every year in the spring, I would try to get my doctor to just prescribe me some antibiotics and they said, oh, sure, here you go. I'd walk out the door, no big deal. Um, so um, they're really trying to get away from that now because a lot of people, A, they don't finish their medication. So they start to feel better and they stop taking their antibiotic. This is the biggest reason why we have this going on in our 
um, society these days. Um, and then they overuse it. So they're getting um, antibiotics on a regular basis when they really don't need it. They just need to give it some more time. So uh, we really want to prevent this from happening. Um, and that way it doesn't become a big larger, a larger of a problem in the future for people. So methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus. So again, our friend Staphylococcus aureus um, has become a problem. Okay. So we all have Staphylococcus aureus all over our skin. It's part of our normal flora. However, it can become a, um, a bad thing in a in a certain way. So if you have an infection, it becomes an opportunist, just an opportunistic um, bacterial that can cause infection. So this organism specifically is highly resistant to antibiotics. So these people end up in the hospital um, and then they also become um, released out into the uh, community. These people, if you've ever had a MRSA infection, if you were ever admitted to the hospital or had surgery or anything like that, they will gown and glove and put you in contact precautions. So you have to, everybody that enters their room has to glove and gown before they enter their room and then take off the glove and gowns as you're leaving the room and use hand sanitizer. So we do not want to do this to people. It's not a very nice thing to do uh, to patients in the hospital or anywhere. So you basically are labeled from here on out if you've ever had one of these infections. Um, so even though you currently don't have it, that makes you a carrier of the MRSA and you will be labeled for the rest of your life, unfortunately. So Staphylococcus aureus um, is a causative agent. Um, it generally occurs in boils, acne, um, and in some forms of septicemia and pneumonia. Okay, so infections may occur from cuts, sores, um, through catheters or breathing tubes. So that is this really, um, you need to be really careful when you're dealing with these people to make sure that you don't cross contaminate things um, and introduce bacteria, let's say in a breathing tube, you know, if they are hooked up to a breathing tube at all, or you're performing catheter care and introduce that bacteria to the side of the catheter so it can work its way up to the urethra and into the bladder. So symptoms of MRSA could be pus formation, fever, swelling, tenderness around the area of infection. Um, individuals with weakened immune systems are more susceptible to this. So people with diabetes, especially, um, or COPD, um, emphysema, and heart disease. Okay, serious staphylococcus um, infections may lead to endocarditis, cellulitis, pneumonia, and um, septic shock syndrome. So um, if you've ever had cellulitis or heard of it, it's very common in people with diabetics uh, that has diabetes and your legs typically will swell and get this red, rashy, orange peel-like appearance to it. Um, it's usually warm to the touch. Um, in the medical setting, we usually draw around a line around it and make sure that it doesn't grow past that place where you've marked. Um, if it does, uh, these people usually have to be hospitalized in order to um, get um, treatment for it. So they get IV antibiotics um, for a couple of days and then they're sent home on just oral antibiotics. So um, diagnosis is usually from a culture of the infected individual. Um, if the organism grows in the presence of methicillin, it is classified as MRSA. So methicillin is a type of um, psyllin antibiotic. So it's a, related to the penicillin family of antibiotics. So if you're using methicillin on it, it still grows, it's classified as MRSA. So the best way to avoid contracting MRSA um, or spreading MRSA infection is through use of good hygiene practices and uh, using antiseptic cream and covering any skin breaks. So <clears throat> vancomycin resistant enterococci are, um, or VRE is what it's referred to. Um, this is a 
Enterococci are the bacteria that is present in your intestines, uh, the female genitalia tract and the environment, okay? Most species of this are harmless. So vancomycin resistant enterococci, enterococci are a strain of these bacteria that has developed resistance to vancomycin specifically and no longer responds to this specific antibiotic. Signs of symptoms of VRE vary. Um, skin or wound VRE infections, um, VRE infections of the urinary and gastrointestinal tracts, and these can be spread, spread by direct contact. So if you come into contact with droplets of the VRE, let's say in feces or something of that nature, or urine, you could potentially get VRE yourself. Okay. To prevent VRE, you always want to wash your hands after using the bathroom and before preparing food. You want to wash or use alcohol-based uh, hand rubs after contact with persons with VRE. So here is the chain of infection. I don't know if you guys have gone over this prior to me coming to teach at New Tech, um, but the chain of infection has five different uh, components to it. So we have one, which is the reservoir host. So that could be the patient with, let's say, VRE, okay? Um, two is the means of an exit. So let's say they have VRE of the um, intestines and you that comes out and you are cleaning um, up a mess from that. Um, that leads to three. So means of transmission, which means that you accidentally got it on your hand and you weren't wearing gloves for some reason, um, and then you touched your face, okay? Hopefully you don't do that, but you touched your face and then it gets in your mouth and woo, means of an entrance is uh, number four. So now you have an entrance that went into your mouth. And then um, the fifth component of that is being a susceptible host. So if you are immune com compromised or you have any of the things that we discussed about before that made you have susceptibility to this specific drug and your body doesn't attack it and kill it, it can become an infection for you. So therefore you are going to repeat the whole cycle again. So the goal is to break the chain of the cycle so you don't get sick from any type of infection. So uh, the reservoir host is, begins as the chain of infection. Okay, so an organism, uh, an organism, either human or animal, harbors or nourishes a pathogen. The pathogen um, gives the pathogen a home for a long time without it suffering any ill effects. Okay, so a lot of um, animals or people are carriers of different diseases, and so they don't aren't affected from it necessarily. Um, so then you transmit it to other people. So a reservoir. Um, Host may become infected by the pathogen. It provide, uh, provides nourishment and sustenance for the pathogen, allowing it to grow. Uh, the person is generally not aware that it's harboring a pathogen. So, so means of an exit. So the pathogen um, <clears throat> to spread to another animal or person, there must be a portal of ex exit from reservoir host. Okay, so this could be respiratory, gastrointestinal um urinary or reproductive tracts of the body uh, open wound or excellent um, portal of exit okay so i don't know if you've ever heard of typhoid mary um, back in the early 1900s she was a typhoid carrier and she was a cook so that being said she carried the pathogen in her body and she would use the restroom and not wash her hands and use proper sanitation because we didn't know about those things back in the day as much as we do now. And she would cook food and prepare food and then serve it to people. And then all of these people in the area where she lived, I think it was back east in like New York or something, got sick from her. Um, and they couldn't figure out where all of these cases of typhus were coming from. So they couldn't figure it out. So then they finally traced it back to her and they took away her um, cooking uh, license and told her she could no longer cook again. Um, however, 
she moved away to a different area and started cooking again and the same thing happened and then i'm not sure exactly what happened with her story you might want to google it if you're interested in this um i think they put her on an island in new york somewhere like on an empty island in new york and made her live there in solitary confinement for the rest of her life um so i don't know exactly what happened to her um, but it is kind of an interesting story to help um, break the chain of um, of infection so um, just a little side note there okay so means of transmission there must be means of transmission for a uh, pathogen to spread from one person to another so in uh, typhoid mary's case she was a carrier and she cooked food so she would not wash her hands after she went to the restroom she would prepare food and put the food in with um that she prepared and serve it to people and so those people then contracted typhoid from her so direct contact or either with infected person discharge or um, excretion of the infected person um, indirect contact would be um, inhaling infected air droplets from cough sneezing touching contaminated objects so or eating contaminated food um, in typhoid mary's case or insects so means of entrance so portal the entry uh, into the new host is required so by means in which a pathogen enters the body so in typhoid mary's case it would be through the mouth okay people ate her food so uh, this could be also respiratory urinary and rep reproductive tracts um, skin and mucous membranes or blood so the host must be susceptible must be available and capable of being infected by the pathogen so someone who's unable to fight off infections so they could be in poor health poor hygiene poor nutrition increased stress levels those types of things okay when the susceptible host becomes infected that person becomes a new reservoir host and the chain of infection begins again fortunately if the chain is broken infection does not occur so medical asepsis uh, helps through this uh, helps prevent all of this through the proper hand washing hygiene and the most uh, and is the most um, important um, mechanism for decreasing the spread of infection so here's the um, stages of the infection process so invasion pathogen enters the body through a portal of entry either respiratory digestive reproductive urinary tracts and skin multiplication is when they reproduce okay incubation period may vary from several days to months or years uh, during in which time the disease is developing but no symptoms appear so there's the prodromal period so this is the first mild sign um, or symptoms appear so this is a very highly contagious period the acute period is where signs and symptoms um, are evident and most severe and then you also have the recovery period where signs and symptoms begin to subside so during which stage does a person stop being contagious what are your guys' thoughts tell me so acute infections um, are <clears throat> many um, caused by many common illnesses that afflict the human body these are considered acute infections such as the common cold and influenza and also COVID-19 okay so uh, rapid transition from invasion to pathogen to the prodromal period and the body usually is able to rid itself of the virus and recover in three to five weeks of onset chronic infections so these are more serious than acute infections um, these uh, effects of this disease cause pathogens that can last for a very long time Okay, so some chronic infections um, are lifelong, such as HIV and hepatitis B. So transition of stages from invasion to prodromal period is um, very based on um, the onset and the symptoms of the infection and the type of infection. Latent infections. So these are characterized by periods of remission and relapse. Remission is a disease treated and there are no longer um, any signs or symptoms present. A relapse um, is the same infection that reoccurs. Um, these could be such things as herpes simplex virus type 1 and um, also herpes um, varicella zoster virus, so basically the shingles. 
So opportunistic infections occur when the host's immune system is impaired by something else that is a disease causing infection or pathogen. So the immune system is already weakened and more susceptible to other infections. Um, so these are patients with severely compromised immune systems. Um, they're more likely to suffer uh, from other opportunistic infections than other people. Nosocomial infections. Um, these infections are acquired while in the hospital or the medical facility, generally in a hospital setting. Um, these are very significant if you work in a hospital. Um, they're also called hospital acquired infections and the hospital um, can get fined or not fined or get less reimbursement from the insurance company if the insurance company deems that they acquired this infection in the hospital. So therefore it's the hospital's um, responsibility to pay the bill for it. Okay. So pathogens are introduced to the body because of poor aseptic technique in the facility. Um, this is very common with catheter associated uh, urinary tract infections or what we call CAUTI. So C-A- UTI. Um, so this is a very common thing that happens in the hospital um, and we want to make sure that that doesn't happen. So we want to protect our patients by using aseptic technique when we um, do catheter cleaning or any types of um, infection control on the patient. Um, so this can also include bloodstream infections. So this is also can happen from improper venipuncture or um, IV lines or procedures that are not performed aseptically, okay? Or somebody does not use aseptic technique when they're delivering medications through an IV um, and the catheter can become um, very much um, infiltrated with bacteria, which we don't want. Again, urinary tract infections, that's the cauti. Um, so you just wanna be aware of that. Okay. You also can have surgical site infections. So this is improper wound care. Um, in all medical settings, um, you, there must be dedicated emphasis on halting the spread of infection and breaking that chain of infection. In fact, when I worked in the hospital, um, we have to take like yearly training on how to do this um, in order to be able to continue working at the hospital. So inflammatory response to an infection. So dilation of the blood vessels allow for increased blood flow, okay? So production, um, production of watery fluid and materials exudate such as pus, which is gross, but it's our body's way of helping us um, to not have that infection or get rid of it. Um, invasion of neutrophils and monocytes to the injured tissues. Uh, neutrophils and monocytes are types of leukocytes or white blood cells um, that prefer phagocytosis, which is eating of the bacteria or the pathogen, which we want it to do. So how is uh, phagocytosis involved in the inflama uh, inflammatory process? I want you to answer that question as well. So the in uh, inflammatory response to infections, there are four cardinal signs redness, heat, swelling, and last but not least, pain, okay? Um, so if somebody um, presents to your clinic or um, an area where you're working, you might wanna just remember those things. Those are crucial things to remember. So prevention and protection. Uh, our largest natural barrier to infection is intact skin. So you wanna make sure that the skin stays intact. You don't want to have any bed sores or um, pressure sores at all, sores at all on the body, okay? Um, and then your acidity of your skin actually inhibits bacterial action. So it keeps Staphylococcus aureus, our friend, in check. So mucous membranes um, lining the body's orifices, so your mouth, your respiratory tract, uh, your eyes, um, your genitalia area, okay? Um, they assist in repelling microorganisms, okay? So the GI tract contains hydrochloric acid. So that's what's in your stomach, okay? And it also has a bacterial cytal action. So it basically kills bacteria. The lymphatic system in the blood um, produces antibodies to help identify and neutralize or destroy disease-causing pathogens that enter the body. 
uh, leukocytes or your white blood cells actively fight pathogenic microorganisms through phagocytosis, which is the process of engulfing, digesting, and destroying pathogens. Yay, go leukocytes! So here's a little diagram of phagocytosis. Pretty cool. We like phagocytosis. Okay, so then you also have your antigen antibody reaction. So lymphocytes produce antibodies during the antigen antibody reaction. Okay, antibodies are protein substances produced by the lymphocytes in the spleen, lymph nodes, and tissue and bone marrow react to the response of antigens or foreign substances or pathogens. Antibodies have ability to neutralize antigens and make them more susceptible to phagocytosis. An antigen is the antibody reaction occurs in response to an invasion of an antigen. So immunity. So this is resistance to a disease. When <clears throat> enough antibodies are produced to provide protections for weeks, months, or years, um, you are providing immunity to uh, future diseases of that same disease that you just fought. Innate immunity is known as natural immunity. Okay, this is the body's first line of defense against pathogens, including skin, mucous membranes, and tears. Acquired active immunity is a person immune to a disease because he or she has been previously exposed or has developed the appropriate antibodies to the pathogen. Artificially acquired active immunity is induced through a vaccination. And then you have passive immunity. So this is a temporary form of immunity, such as antibodies passed from mother to an infant through breast milk. So I like to think, I'm not sure on this, I like to think that my daughter has immunity somewhat to chicken pox because while I was breastfeeding her, I had shingles. So um, and I was breastfeeding her actively during this time. And so I'm pretty sure that I passed my antibodies to her to help her prevent her from getting um, chicken pox as an infant. So, yay. Any questions um, or concerns about this um, lecture, please shoot me an email or write a little ditty on Google Classroom and let me know. I hope everybody's doing well. I miss y'all and I miss your faces and just take care and we will hopefully see you tomorrow at our Zoom meeting. Take care guys, see ya.